public comment. This is for comment of anything that's not currently on the agenda. Can you identify yourself, please? Uh, Michael Binder. Okay. Um, I would like to point out at the last select board meeting, um, after Brooke Singledine uh, defined what a energy facility development is, uh, the session that wasn't done, but at one hour, 19 minutes and 45 seconds, he said that he would like some more legal information before they uh, you know, voted on the topic. And then a minute and 27 seconds later, uh, Larry Sackwitz said he uh, wanted to get that info and put the issue on the next agenda. Um, I was disappointed that it's not on tonight's agenda. What I request is that we put on tonight's agenda a decision to uh, vote on this at the April meeting and before that time, uh, get the legal opinion that I think uh, Pat French wanted about what is an energy facility development. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? What about that question, Sam? Is that a definite time that we can make a decision? I can't hear you, Pat. Yeah, no, I was going to say the same thing. I, I really can't. Could anybody hear that? I couldn't no, hear I it. I can hear Michael fine, but I can't hear Pat. No, I can't hear Pat either. <clears throat> no. Nope. No, you're both kind of weak. It's a little better. Oh, hang on. Let's see if this is better. Try that. Can you hear that right there? That's getting better. Yeah. All right. Uh, how about that? Much better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, Pat. All right, Pat. Start over. <laughs> Three times. Third time. Um, what I was suggesting, since it's not on the agenda tonight, could we set a definite time when it was going to be on? And I would make a motion that the Davis Road solar issue be on the agenda for our regularly scheduled April meeting. Be April 14th would be the day. Well, I'm not hearing it get seconded. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to ask a question actually. Um, and I had a little bit of difficulty hearing Michael, but if he could repeat the and, and maybe get closer to the mic in doing so um that, his assertion of what was said at the last meeting uh that led him to believe that it was going to be on the agenda for this meeting I, I i i don't recall that we agreed to put it on the agenda for this meeting i um, my recollection is that we 
um, with Larry directing the meeting that we just let the issue go, essentially. That, that is correct. But um, Larry Sackwitz did say at one point, at one hour, 21 minutes and two seconds into the meeting, that he wanted uh, that he wanted to get more legal information as Pat had requested, and that it wanted to put it on the next meeting's agenda. But you are correct; there never was a vote or an agreement to do that. Mm -hmm. And what what was the legal opinion that you were seeking, Pat? I want to know the attorney's opinion of development and what his opinion on the issue was, not whether we could. He certify it, but what his opinion on the actual issue was. You mean the issue of building on slopes greater than 25% or the, the overall issue of putting a, a solar array in that given location? I'm not clear. The overall issue of whether this project meets our um, zoning regulation. Maybe somebody can clarify, but I don't think we asked the lawyer that. I thought the lawyer got asked some pretty specific questions to give an opinion on. I don't know that we could ask the lawyer to tell us whether the zoning, a zoning permit should have been issued. It's actually, if I may speak, it's not a zoning issue. It's a town plan issue. And I think the legal question that I thought you were struggling with at the last meeting was what is the definition of an energy facility development? It's very clear in the town plan that an energy facility development is prohibited on, lo on slopes greater than 25%. Uh, the, they also mentioned in the town plan that this principal structure of the energy facility uh, must have setbacks, the 50 foot setbacks from side and rear. And that's the solar panels. We all agree those are the principal so, structures. Mike, However, Mike it was a board. Whoa, whoa, board Mike. Hey, enough. Oh, enough. This is a board discussion. And the question that was being raised, we were addressing what Pat wanted a legal opinion on. So uh, we're trying to narrow in what he feels the question still is. And it was on a zoning thing. So we were trying to, you know, a lawyer wouldn't look at a whole zoning packet that came in for any application. <clears throat> I guess uh, the question is, and well, for the record, my family doesn't own the property anymore. I no longer have a conflict. So I'm not recusing myself from this discussion. The, um, I guess the question is, does the board feel there's more to be discussed with this, or are we done with the topic? I, I, um, I think you got you muted. Thank you nope, muted nope. yourself down. Did he? Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, sorry, I, I got my buttons mixed up there. Um, I personally feel as if we need to get finished with the topic. And if putting it to rest would benefit from having a motion to reconfirm our previous um, uh, authorization or, or endorsement of the project, then I would be willing to put that motion forward if that would be beneficial. Otherwise, I think we should just let it rest as it is. I feel like I've heard enough already. I'm not sure what else I would learn from additional meeting. You might learn the legal definition of an energy facility development. So for the board members, um, I believe we have a motion that's been offered by Tom um at this point which is to and maybe he wants to reword it or do whatever but tom's willing to put the motion forward uh, i i move that we um 
for lack of a better word, reconfirm our previous um, uh, authorization of the project uh, in whatever language you want to use there um, uh, as, as previously uh, moved two or three meetings ago. I don't know if that's adequate wording or not. I'm happy to let somebody wordsmith it if they'd like. I think it's important that we send a message forward that we have underscored and endorsed the, the, the actions of, of the Planning Commission with regard to this project. And we've already taken that step, but if it, if it serves the purpose of moving this along, I would move that we reiterate that support. I'm not sure that that well, I think a couple of things. I think one is that we we approved this, I think, quite a long time ago um, as a board. And I think the you know the planning commission has has requested that we, you know, basically do nothing and that we keep, you know, that approval in place. And and I think we should keep that approval in place. And so I think we are, we have affirmed what the Planning Commission has done already. Okay, I'm I'm fine with that. If 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 that's sufficient, um, if that's sufficient endorsement moving forward, I just think it's time to to move on. So I'm okay with that, Larry. Fine. Okay. Any other comments on that topic? Seeing none, we'll move forward to approving the agenda. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Carrie's consent calendar. We have uh, meeting minutes from February and warrants. Motion to approve the consent calendar. Meetings and warrants. I can't. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is business. And first up is select board reorganization. Okay, so <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion that uh, we retain Trini as chair. Second that. Any other nominees? <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> Assuming you choose to accept, Trini. Um, yeah. All right. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I'd like to. I'd like to move that we retain uh, Larry Sakowitz as vice chair. Second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Stained. Motion carries. And sticking with the same slate. Where is Pretty it? much. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> we... we didn't quite catch that. Um, Pat. I'll move that Tom Ayers be the secretary of the board. Uh, huh? You good with that, Tom? Yeah, I'm fine with that. But what does it entail, Perry? I know you've done it previously. Oh, basically nothing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm okay with that. Not too hard to do that job. Pretty much, you know, staff is taking care of the notes and so right. I, I mean, it may, might be my signature on occasion or something like that, but I'm okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. All right, good. And I'll second that. So, <laughs> wow, changing of the guard, Perry. I don't know. <laughs> you have a motion, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. 
Next up is um, committee appointments and reappointments. Um, we'll just start with the first committee and work our way down the list. We um, said we revised list earlier today. There are, we've got the color copy in front of you. The folks in blue are the ones we've heard back from. Everyone in yellow is someone who's up for reappointment or that we haven't confirmed their willingness at this moment. Or maybe the arts and culture. Hmm. I have all of the arts and culture um, information when we get to that. Hang on, I gotta find that. Yeah, I'm looking for that myself. Yeah. Looking around 3.30, 4 o'clock-ish. everybody. Oh, it came in from Tim? Yep. Yep. That's why it didn't come up. You can't search Trevor if Kim sent it. <laughs> no, you gotta search. It looks like that one's from Kim, so. All right, so uh, starting off with the economic development, it looks like um, we have uh, Damian DiNicola, Ken Caddow, Sarah Jackson, Bethany Silloway, and Jay Hooper looking to get reappointed. You will join Mary Richter, Josh, and, and Perry as uh, select board liaison currently. May I speak, please? Um, I, I'm, I was wondering, I thought I was still a council member and then be the chair. Am I misunderstanding the position? No, you're Is, fine. Okay. Yeah, you're still a council member. You're still, okay. count, yeah, you're still a council member. Okay, I, I was misunderstanding because I didn't quite understand when my name was mentioned and where it fit in the categories. Well, you're, you're still there. <laughs> And you're there, but you're identified as chair. <laughs> I, yeah, I Any, sent yeah. updates to everybody, so I'm not sure what happened, but that's okay. Okay, so any concerns with any of those? We do have a vacancy, so we've got to find somebody for that. So we'll work on that. Correct. Uh, arts and culture. Okay, we have... Um six people re-upping uh, for another one-year appointment and one new appointment and two vacancies because it's been a nine-member committee since it was founded. Um, the people who are re-upping are the following and some of them aren't listed here because there were some transitions during the past year that were previously approved. Um, so the re-upping are Jessica Wilkinson of the um, uh, of the Craft Center, Jenny Albert of the Arts Bus, Vincent Freeman of the Underground Studio, uh, Sonny Holt, uh, Karen Dillon of Chandler, Chris Wilson, uh, the dentist and sculptor here in town, and the new <clears throat> member who has sent us her letter of interest is a woman named Barbara Mills. She uh, goes by the nickname Babs Mills. She's a relatively new resident of Randolph, having moved here just before the pandemic. <clears throat> she is both a visual artist and a, um, a pop and jazz singer. <clears throat> and she basically just said that since she arrived here, she has been working with local artist Stephen Samantha Augustus on some projects and has also been assisting Vincent Freeman in the operation of the underground recording studio. So she brings a music and visual arts background to the committee. And with those seven, we have, um, we still have two remaining vacancies, which the committee is looking to fill in the coming year. Tom, you have two stepping down then? Uh, the, the ones that have stepped down from the list you see highlighted here in yellow, um, or Dave Hurwitz stepped down and Andy Mueller stepped down. Okay. So, um, uh, and, and they were replaced by um, uh, Jess Wilkinson and uh, Jenny Albert over the course of the past year. Okay. Any questions okay. on those? Nope, sounds good to me. Kim, did you get that list or would you like Tom to send it to you? I would love it if Tom would send it to me. Thank you, Trini. I will. I will email that to you uh, tomorrow morning. Thank you, Tom. Okay, Energy Committee. It looks like we have three up for renewal: Gary Durr, Susan Mills, and Marianne Savas, uh, and Jeff Grout, 
who is up for renewal but hasn't confirmed can't take care of that for us kim well yeah i'm well I'm, i don't want to speak for him but i'm pretty sure he is not renewing all right uh and pat you want to still be the liaison on that one and just back backing up obviously i'll still be the liaison in the arts and culture as well so um, yeah, we'll just have to add that on, Jim. I would have brought it up, Tom, but you weren't on the list. I'll, I'll, I'll add it. I'll add it uh, to the list <laughs> I send to Kim. Okay. All right. <laughs> Moving forward, so we'll need to find another member for the energy group. Um, Recreation committee. Looks like we have Valerie Schoolcraft, Kristen Chandler, Larry Devignan, Ryan Lacroix, Paul Ray, Kristen Gage and Kyla Grace and Larry as the board member. So <clears throat> it's my understanding that two of these members are stepping down. Valerie is one of them and I don't remember Kyla. who's who is the other one, Kyla. Kyla. So I believe Valerie and Kyla are no longer available for this committee. Mm. Mm. I learned that yesterday. They're both great folks. That's too bad. Mm -hmm. Other interest. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Larry still want to be the liaison on that? Yep. Yep. I'm good with that. Okay. Water, wastewater. <laughs> Looks like we only have two. Wow. Um, on, on water, we actually have. Um, I'm, I'm a voting member, so that's that makes three. And then we have a fourth member who was approved um, a little earlier this year. It's um, Suzanne Pickett, who had been previously on the um, Water Wastewater Committee and has rejoined us. And so, so we have four right now. Um, East Valley Community Group, there was a new list that came from them uh, late, well, late no, it wasn't too late, probably late morning today. Uh, did you get that, Kim? Yeah, and I updated this to reflect that. Okay. Oops, now I lost my... Okay. Um... So we have uh, Josie Crothers, Mark Kelly, Marsha Hammond, Allison Lyle, and Bobby Kimberly going into the parts of that group that were rotating. All right, Conservation Commission. You have three members up. Uh, no confirmation on any of those? I, I, happen, I happen to know that um, TJ Riley was replaced by Emily Lewis earlier this year, I think. I'm pretty sure TJ does not long live in Randolph anymore. Yeah, I wrote to Brandon to ask him. I haven't heard back yet, just to make, just to double check. And so yeah, have we, we haven't heard from Chandler, Emily, or Ian at this point? No, nope. not yet. Development Review Board, yikes, it's a little slim. Yeah. And you haven't heard from any of them if they want to be reappointed? I have not heard anything. We haven't, I think, Josh, I think I saw you step on. Have you heard anything from me, Chris, Matt, and Paul? Um, I, I, I think their intentions are to continue to serve, but I was not aware of um, them not forwarding that request to you guys. So um, yeah, but I think their intention is all of them to to serve. Um. So at this time, we only have three members of a seven member board. So we do not have a quorum to hear any permits. Um, That's definitely a problem. 
a problem. <clears throat> I don't mind stepping on short term. Let me stress that short term. I did my 21 years on that board, um, but we need to find somebody to, to take at least one of those seats so we have a quorum. But if you have, if there's no challenge against it, I will step on short term until we find enough to have a quorum just so we don't hold up permits. Hi, this is Julie. Chris happens to be here and he said he would if that is a question. Oh, good, yeah. Thank you. Well, then that's one. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. So we, we do have past, two alternates. We do have yeah, two alternates, the, um, Perry. The alternates? Yeah, Me Perry and, and Sonny. Yeah, we were we were alternates. So I would stay in that position for a little bit. Okay. Um. I would be I would be happy to um, I would be happy to step up um, in a more permanent capacity either as an alternate or as a as a full member if that would be to the select board's liking. Oh golly, you're a full member. We just fixed that. That's easy. <laughs> Put his name in there. Oh boy. <laughs> Kim, I'll email you in the morning if I wake up and change my mind. No, I'm I'm kidding. I'll 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 happily do that. Development issues are of considerable interest to me. So, see that secretary's job got you inspired, Tom, didn't it? Oh, no, I'm a glutton for punishment, is what it is. Yeah. That's great. You hang on a minute. We'll talk about planning commission. Maybe you'd like that position too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So right now on the planning commission, we have one position up, which is Paul Ray's. Uh -huh. Any idea of uh, re upping for four years? Well, uh, hold on a second. Um, I think you should chat with Sonny about that because my understanding is that Matt has decided to depart. Oh, is Sonny here? No, I don't see him. I don't see him, but that's a, that's that's you know uh, that's a question. So we need to reach out to Sonny on that one and see if he's had any correspondence with Matt about that. I, I, think, I think I think Matt had to resign. Yes. Um, and I, I believe Paul said he was not going to um, re up after twelve years. Yes, Paul. Paul is Paul. Paul is. I can't twist his arm anymore. <laughs> All right. So um, we have vacancies on the planning commission then also that yes. we need to be looking at. Yes, we do. This isn't all our committees. What's, what's right. missing? Oh, budget. Oh, yeah. Obviously. Yeah, but Trini, can you just say who's on Capital the planning? Who's on what? Names we have for the BRB. Can you say that again? Um, Chris Reckia, Matt Morowski, and Paul Putney. And Tom now. Right. And Tom, right? Right. And alternates are Perry and Sonny. And Perry is an alternate. And Sonny. Sonny. And I just got I just got confirmation from Matt Morowski that he will remain on the DRB. Okay, good. Hey guys, this is Chris Reckia. How are you doing? Chris, we just put you back on the planning commission, right? I, uh, no, the uh, DRB, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go back to? Uh, yeah, yeah well, I'll go anywhere you want me to go, but the reality is, yeah, I'm interested in continuing to serve. I think most of the other members are also interested in continuing to serve um, anybody who's up for re-election. I, I have not heard anything other than that. So if you've not heard from them, I, I would assume that they would be interested. And so, yeah, so thanks. Um, I would, I, I welcome the opportunity to continue to con 
continue. I did not, I, you know, I declined. I, I came back from the chair because I, I did think that it was important for other people to step up and to have a more rotating chair than we had previously. So, you know, I served for a few years and now Matt is doing a great job as chair and I am secretary. So that all works. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to continue that. Sounds good. Now, what about the planning commission, Chris? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not doing planning commission. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, sweet. No, 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 no. All right, your time is up. <laughs> I have another candidate for the planning commission that I'm going to reach out to. So we can leave that the way it is and see if we get a letter of interest here in a little while. Okay. Isn't there a bunch of others that we appoint? Don't we have to appoint like the TAC member to the RPC, the dog catcher? um there's a list of them well, that we used to do at the beginning of the year each year there was a whole sheet that came and there were some of those type positions too at the beginning we can catch them next month i'll sure. see if i can find one of the prior ones that we used to do and send it yeah. to him okay thank you Okay, given what we have now and what we've just gone through, entertain a motion to reappoint those that we've identified. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, discussion of Kimball Library's HVAC improvements. Hi folks, Amy Grasmick here. I'm the director of Kimball Library. Um, if it suits the select board, I'll just do a quick verbal recap of the information I've already sent. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, last November, the library trustees made the decision to close the library building to the public. Um, because if you cast your mind back, COVID cases were going through the roof. And the library's only ventilation uh, is provided by opening windows and doors. So a combination of the situation with COVID plus the cold weather um, really required them to make the the decision to close the building to the public because we could not assure the staff or patron safety in there. Um, so now we're faced with how to make sure that we never have to do that again. And the simple solution is to introduce mechanical ventilation to the building. Um, as it happens, the central air conditioning that serves the main level is already beyond the end of its lifespan. And so this turns out to be one of those times when things actually, the timing is right. Um, it will be possible to both deal with that climate control issue and introduce ventilation to the main level in one fell swoop. Uh, the lower level of the library is a different climate zone. It served with different um, cooling. It has different needs because of the humidity as a, as a basement. And so in order to introduce mechanical ventilation to the lower level of the building, we're going to need to look at installing new uh, equipment and ducting. Um, but once again, this is kind of nice timing because there have already been climate control issues downstairs in terms of adequate cooling. Um, and so, like I said, it, it feels like the stars are aligning kind of nicely for once when it comes to this capital improvement to the historic building. Um, another way that the stars feel like they're aligning a bit is the availability of grants and potentially matching funds 
Although of course, matching funds are always a bit of a challenge. Um, the cultural facilities grant that the Vermont Arts Council administers uh, is an excellent match for this kind of a project. And the grant um, that they award is up to $30,000. This has a one-to-one -one matching requirement. So then goes the hunt for the match, right? Um, what I have found so far as potential sources for the match is three potential pots of ARPA money. So one of these would be funds that the state will be administering. Uh, they have one category of funds at that level that will go toward energy efficiency projects. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is the Department of Libraries at the state level has asked and has been included in the governor's um, budget for $15.9 million of ARPA money that would be distributed to public libraries for improvements, repairs, and so on. So that looks like a nice um, possibility. And last but not least in terms of ARPA money is the money that the town of Randolph will be able to make decisions about um, how that those funds will be distributed. So yay, let's hear it for ARPA. Um, two other potential sources for matching funds for that cultural facilities grant are town capital improvement funds and funds that the library trustees have control and decision-making authority over. So what makes this a little nerve wracking is that in order to introduce mechanical ventilation into the building before the next cold season, we need to get onto a contractor's schedule now. Um, just as an example, ARC Mechanical, who put together a proposal, uh, which, by the way, is just a preliminary proposal, um, they're scheduling nine months out at this point, and I don't imagine other contractors are have much more um, capacity at this point to do a project earlier. So what I am envisioning and what I think will work is to make the application to the Vermont, Vermont Arts Council Cultural Facilities Grant, which is due to them on May 2nd, and concurrently to get a final scope of work developed for the HVAC improvements, <clears throat> assuming which of course I will, because I'm optimistic that Kimball Library is awarded that $30,000 grant. We would receive notification on August 31st, and we could conceivably start the project on September 1st. So that would mean, like I said, developing the scope of work, bidding out the project and selecting a contractor and being ready to pull the trigger pretty much as soon as the contractor can get into the building. So part of this is just informational to you about the situation at the library. It has been a real loss to the community for them not to be able to enter the building regardless of the many, many ways we have been able to provide low and no contact services. We really don't wanna be in this position for another cold season ever again. Um, and the other part of this is a request for the select board to approve the library's application for the cultural facilities grant for $30,000. And also to request that the select board keep in mind the potential matching funds that are out there, um, those whether or not they turn out to be available in the end, of course, is still a question, but at least there's a lot of money washing around right now that we might be able to leverage for the project. Amy, do you, do you have a sense of um, 
what the process is for the Vermont Department of Libraries, uh, potential funding and what the timeline is for that. That seems like a pretty significant pool of, uh, of dollars for libraries statewide. It is, and so I hope Representative Satkowitz is listening very attentively here. Um, <laughs> the, the last action that I'm aware of was that the, the acting state librarian provided testimony at the beginning of February um, in the House Committee on um, Corrections and Institutions. So my understanding is that the governor has included the $15.9 million request to direct ARPA money specifically for those, you know, for capital improvements in libraries in his plan for the ARPA funds. Mm -hmm. um, where that is right now in the legislature, I'm not quite sure, but the the Department of Libraries is still hopeful that that money will be, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, earmarked, I'm not sure that's quite the right word, but mm -hmm. will be available for that, mm -hmm. for the purpose of, for that, for those purposes. Mm -hmm. And do you have any idea, I, I know you're going to apply for the full, uh, the fully cap $30,000 uh, in the arts, uh, arts Council's Cultural Facilities Grant. Do you, and, and you, you may not, but do you have any idea what their pool of dollars that they're working with for that particular grant is this fiscal year? I don't have that yeah. at the on, a, on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm not surprised, but I, I just, Having sat on Arts Council grant um, grant making decision making groups in in, in the past, um, applying for thirty thousand and actually getting the full thirty thousand, depending on the pool of dollars and the number of uh, awardable applicants they have, you know, it's not necessarily a slam dunk that you will get the full thirty thousand. But you're probably aware of that, um, you know you could apply for 30 and get 20 or 15 or whatever, depending on the amount of dollars they have to, um, to allocate across all the libraries in the, or all the cultural facilities that apply uh, and, and are successful. So it's just something to be aware of. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm still aiming toward optimism and I'm yeah, sure. yeah. very successful with, the grants that I have written yeah, to yeah. the Arts Council, to the Division for Historic Preservation. So, you know, I can't promise that I'll be successful this time around, but I yeah, have a pretty yeah. good track record. Good, good, good for you. In the application, do you have to identify the match, Amy? That is a really excellent question, and I should have looked into that. The um, Arts Council is doing a webinar training in a couple of weeks. So I will definitely have the answer for that after the training, but I'm sorry I did not, I did not think to look to see if they require identifying where the match is coming from. So we've set up a committee in Randolph to evaluate all the different use and come out with what they think should be the plan for Randolph. Um, I know in our capital reserve, we just went there um, for the library and the next priority was the town building. So I'm not sure that's a good, it doesn't, I don't know that that's a solid match source for this. Has that ARPA, has the town ARPA uh, committee, which we just, I think was the last meeting or maybe two meetings ago that we formed that, um, have they met yet? Yes, we have. Um, wh what's the process for putting something like this before them, Perry? So Trevor is going to, he's getting us some resources. Um, we're looking to not reinvent the wheel here. We'd right. like to see what other communities are using the funds for <clears throat> to get some ideas. We have some suggestions that have already come to us. Um, so before we're going to you know, tackle those requests, 
um, we need to know what qualifies and that's what Trevor's working on. So, you know, we've got, we've got some, we've got some, some thoughts on this, but I'd really like to be really crystal clear about where the money can be used and how it can be used. And, you know, there is a length of time on this and we have a pretty long length of time. So I'm not, I'm not <clears throat> thinking that we need to rush into spending that. Um, but, you know, like in this particular situation, it seems like this, this probably would qualify. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to have to, you know, get that determination from Trevor. And, you know, there may be something that says, well, if you're getting ARPA money from this, you can't use ARPA matching funds from this. I don't know those things yet. So I'm still digging into this. So it could be a little while before we get answers to questions like that. Mm hmm whether or not the matching funds can come from another ARPA pool. So, Amy, I'm just, just sort of brainstorming here. You, you do mention Kimball Library funds as a possible source of the match. Do you think the trustees would be amenable to pledging those in the interim if the grant requires a match before May 2nd when you file the grant. Um, I'm wondering if the, if the library has funds that you could pledge as a match and then continue to pursue the ARPA funding and other um, potential funding sources and, and, and flip to those. But at least for the purposes of your grant application, if it is required, you could show a good faith effort to come up with a match. Just a suggestion if, if, if that's something that's going to be asked of you. Well, I won't speak for the trustees in terms of, you know, them, them making a, right. them voting on this. I will say that they recognize how vital it is to get mechanical ventilation introduced into the building. There's right. no, there's, they have no illusions that we can carry on with the situation that we have now. Right. So they're right. very motivated. Let me put it that way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm just suggesting that as an interim solution because it looks like the bureaucracy of the ARPA funding, which may ultimately be your ideal source. Um, it, it just feels like between now and May 2nd, the bureaucracy of that process might be a little daunting. And I'm, I'm just suggesting that as an interim possibility um, for, for the trustees to consider. Um, um, I, I do wanna make sure Perry that, um, because I threw a lot of ARPA, ARPA, ARPA out there, just to be clear that the grant that I propose applying for is these are state funds that have nothing to do with ARPA. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that what you said, what you envision that there might be um, a problem with getting ARPA money from multiple tools for a similar project. I don't think that that, that will pro um, prove to be a barrier in this case, mm -hmm. right? That's fine. We're, we're just waiting on guidance here. And that's one of the problems with the ARPA funds is having dealt with a lot of this stuff and, and COVID money and all this other stuff that comes, the rules keep changing. And, you know, interim rules didn't mean nothing until they make final rules. And then the final rules have changed in the past. So <clears throat> this is one of the reasons why we had this conversation in that committee meeting that I'm a little leery to go committing any funds or taking on any projects, you know, and, and saying, yeah, we'll do that until we actually know what the guidelines are. And having dealt with that problem in the past, um, I'm not interested in going down a path here where we think we're gonna do something and then all of a sudden we get different rulings. So yeah. Yeah. it's just been, it's honest to God, it's been a real struggle <clears throat> from any funds that I've seen, you know, idle money was dedicated to one thing and then they changed the rules nine months later. PPP was dedicated to one thing and then they changed the rules nine months later. I have a suspicion that that is what is going to happen here. And we may find that, you know, we may have more flexibility in the end once people start saying, hey, I got this project or I got that project. And then they'll write their congressmen and their legislators and they'll say, oh, yeah, well, that qualifies. This is what's happened in the past. So so right Julie, now, just put a, Julie just right. put a good note out. The USDA money um, that's open right now, that's a good, a good avenue to research, too. 
that might pick up half of it and you could use the state funds as the match. There's a USDA facilities grant that's out there um, right now. And I see Amy commented on it, but maybe what we wanna do then is um, make a, take a, a motion, take a motion to allow Amy to apply for both grants. Well, I'll, I'll do that. I'll make a motion for that right now that she should apply for both grants. I'll second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? By both grants, could you just indicate what both you mean? The, the, uh, I think you mean the Vermont Arts Council and the USDA Community Facilities Grant, right, Trini? Right. Yeah. God, I love him as a secretary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking notes. I'm counting on you, Trevor and Kim, but um, yeah. Yeah, well, that's my intent. So that was the motion. All right. I make a comment. Sure. We were looking for other funds that might help with doing the dome. And it seems like there's some more opportunities here for that. You're saying the USDA application should be the dome and the HVAC? Well, or any of these other ones, the upper funds. Mm -hmm. Whatever might be a possibility. I think that would yeah. be <laughs> I think in the interest of keeping it, um, just having a lot of experience with grants, especially with the Arts Council, um, keeping it focused just on one, on this specific issue is probably more advisable than trying to, to mix in other things. That's not to say that the um, ARPA funds couldn't be a potential resource for the Dome as well. But I think in this instance, especially given the um, the time constraints that the library is operating under and, and the, the extended delay in actually getting the work done, um, I, I think we'd be better off focusing laser-like on the HVAC system in this instance. That's just my, my feeling. I wanna see us succeed with these and not go off in a bunch of different directions, so. You could call it HVAC and weatherization and do them both, right? The, that's true. You, if if you, you can, if you, if you can, <laughs> if you can finesse it that way. But but then, you know, does that commit a portion of the thirty thousand dollars from the um, from the arts council to a portion of the dome work too? Uh, um, no, they're two separate grants. Ah, you're you're actually suggesting filing separate grants for both things. Okay. Okay, I wasn't clear on that. I thought you were talking about bundling them. I was talking bundling for USDA. Oh, okay. Go for the 30,000 for HVAC through the Arts Council, but bundle the USDA one. Oh, okay, well. yeah, that and makes, that makes sense. Absolutely. I, I, I thought you were talking about bundling them for both. Oh, no, I don't think you're going to get more than the 30,000. So there's no reason to bundle and go higher yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah. All right, next up is uh, consider authorizing an application yeah. for Salisbury Square. Hi, all. Um, I sent uh, through Trevor, I hope you all got it, the, a little synopsis and current site plan of what we'd be asking for. I don't know if, how much you'd like me to go through uh, that, just summarize what's in there. What's your preference? So it's on the record, maybe just a quick summary of what the project is, Julie. Sure. Well, as you all know, uh, we've been trying for a long time to find um, a way to complete the Salisbury Square project. And um, there's been a lot of movement in a lot of areas. We, you've already talked about price and volatility these days and uh, also changing demographics and needs. Um, 
But uh, so we've had some changes in the site plan over time, but we've come upon a plan that we think has um, the best chance of funding and implementation. Um, and that's what we're proposing to um, apply to CDBG for. Um, the plan has changed. If you look at the site plan, the site plan now includes 12 units in three buildings of rental properties and, um, and nine home sites um, for reasons of, of uh, funder, uh, some of the, the funder peculiarities that we uh, that you were talking about earlier, um, we show one portion of the site in a sort of a gray green as phase three development um, that we can fit two or three units there, but because HUD cannot fund in that area, we're calling that a phase three, but we can put um, uh, continuing with our 36 unit uh, previously permitted total density, we're looking at one or two units there, depending um, uh, in, in that phase. And on the plan is shown 12 units in that sort of pinkish area in the middle of rental. Wow. And that is the portion uh, of, the, of the project wow. that we're talking about today. Um, so the project will, that we're, um, that would go first, the part of the project that would go first and that we're talking about for the CDBG grant is the infrastructure, the road, right of way, sidewalks, uh, and the rental part in the middle. And the reason for that is that in addition to the Northern Borders funding, which we've already received toward the infrastructure, um, the best or possibly only way that we have discovered to pay for the infrastructure, which the housing folks do not like to pay for, um, is uh, through leveraging um, tax credits, federal tax credits. And so the federal tax credit equity, we believe can cover the cost of the match to Northern borders for the infrastructure costs, as well as covering a lot of the equity for the rental. Once the infrastructure is in, that unburdens the home ownership costs of that additional um, you know, cost and, and allows us to uh, lower um, the cost, not have to include that overhead in the home ownership part, which would come next. Um, so we've talked to CDBG um, about this. They're anticipating us coming in uh, with this request, um, they've indicated that 1 million is, is a, I know it's hard, it's hard to think of 1 million as a reasonable thing, but these days 1 million is a reasonable request for infrastructure in that they, they would need uh, more than half of the rental to be under 80% of, uh, to, to benefit uh, households of under 80% median income which this does. Um, and they would also apparently look at it as if, um, you know, it's benefiting the future development of the home ownership. So obviously no guarantees there. It's a competitive process, but we have had discussions with the staff there about it. And they are obviously also uh, prioritizing housing these days. And so that's, uh, that's to our benefit. Uh, the process is that the application has to go through the town and we are a, a sub grantee. Um, and so we sort of do this together. We would be writing the grant and, um, and you know, helping with the notices and everything. But the actual submission is made by the town. Um, and then I just to sort of give some uh, a sort of reminder about some other things that we would need to do with uh, or uh, get support by the town to make this feasible. Um, obviously, project support in these days, um, there's a lot of support, a lot, more, a lot of support for housing everywhere, but supporting this project in our area, if it comes to that with funders. Um, also, we need to go back and re-up the water sewer allocation that we paid for previously and just because the length of time has expired and we would go through the water sewer committee 
first and then that comes to the select board afterwards with that request. And then finally, we had talked about a request um, that we would anticipate making to the town to adopt uh, the roadway. In this case, it would be just the loop road that we would just the that sort of circular amount of the road, not the two dog legs. And that would be done after we had obtained um, obtained our local permit amendment approvals. So that's the sort of the outline of that portion of the project. Um, the next application uh, deadline is the 12th. And this grant requires a hearing before application. Um, it has to be noticed uh, at least, I think it's 15 days in advance of the hearing dates. Usually the select board meets directly after that to vote on the question of applying. And it can happen no later than I think it's four days before the grant application is due and hopefully a little more just to enable the town and us to uh, finalize the application, get it in good shape and submit it in time. So what we're asking today is that the select board considers setting that hearing, uh, which is the prerequisite to the application, um, set a meeting directly afterwards to vote on approving that the application goes forward. And then in the meantime, we would be um, working to, um, you know, write the, the meat of the grant so that it's ready for application uh, once that process is through. Does that make sense? Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So Julie, in the past, we've held the hearing and voted at that same meeting instead of two separate meetings. Is that not allowed? Yeah, I think the hearing has to be, it, it can happen essentially at the same time or sequentially, but I think it has to be a separate, the hearing is separate from the actual select board meeting that follows. I think, um, I, I'm not an expert in these things, but I think they're supposed to be two separate meetings. They can be, they can be sequential. Yeah, I think that's how we've done it in the past. Um, one of the questions that came up with this, uh, do you have a image of what this is going to look like um, a few years ago when the idea was floated of the the efficient housing? Mm -hmm. A lot of people were all up in arms about they called them ugly houses <laughs> and not wanting the ugly houses. Um, so do we know what this is going to look like? Well, we have a few different house styles on the home ownership side or the rental side. Are you talking about? Because this this is the the rental side, but I can answer for both. And it's, all you're asking to apply for right now is the rental side, right? Not the home ownership side. Yes, the CDBG funds. Um, it's it's uh, harder to apply those to the home ownership because they're restricted on the housing side to under eighty percent median income and um, and it's just hard to reach that um, without a lot of subsidies. So uh, that's gonna be a separate request potentially with different funders who are, I'm sure you heard the term, the, the missing middle. There's a lot of um, effort these days at the state level and the federal level to find funding um, for folks between 80 and 120% median income for home ownership. Which is not to say that you can't, you know, try to extend home ownership lower, but, um, but the, you know, it's just much harder to reach those, and so the, uh, and also there's been very little subsidy for people at or just slightly below or above median income, and so that's likely to be the targeted area for the home ownership. And uh, CDBG can't touch that. So we're trying to leverage their funds with this part because it will enable the infrastructure and the rental to be done at once. Yeah, I just, um, I'd like to see what we're supporting before we support just the, the flat plan that's there yeah, today. Yeah, sure. I can send you the, um, I can send you or sh share um, just the, so the fourplexes. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I can either share screen or send you um, those. It would certainly be 
something we would have for the hearing and the application. They're modern looking, uh, but they're a nice design for the fourplex. It's essentially two, uh, it's a connect, two connected um, two-story buildings uh, with, um, you know, staircase in the middle accessing the two. And if, I don't know if you can, you, I think you had a, a rule not to share screens, um, but I can certainly send that along before the hearing and we would have that incorporated into the, into the application documents that would be ready for the hearing. Okay. Um, on adopting a road, I think we have a policy on that where you have to meet yeah. a certain design and it has to meet certain criteria before you can even request the yeah, board we, taking it over. So I think there's a process by which we go through for that. So I would say on that front, you just have to follow whatever that defined process is. Yes, we've actually um, done a pretty deep dive into all of the road policies, uh, state and local and, and um, fire marshal stuff and um, and had a meeting with, with Trevor uh, and sort of made up a memo that we reviewed what we thought was the process. And I think I think we were roughly on the same page. I don't know if Trevor's had any thought about that since, but um, but we uh, our engineers believe that we can meet all those standards. And I will leave it to Larry on his thoughts of whether the water wastewater committee will extend the date that's expired on your other water wastewater permits. I would suspect that we would, um, but I can't speak for the entire committee. What? So can we get Josh to weigh in on this too? Because this is a significant deviation from what the original proposal was back 12 years ago. Uh, well, I think, I think Julie mentioned um, something about seeking amendments to the local permits um, when she was describing it, Julie. Um, is that what, right. did I hear that correctly? Yes, um, so the, the density uh, has isn't changing in that there's still 36 units. It's the type of unit and the the location mostly within that loop road. The lot lines have changed. Uh, most of the other areas have not changed or not changed very much. So we would be sticking within um, the infrastructure. Basically, it was the same and the density is the same. Um, so we um, would propose amendments to Act 250 and the town. And I think also there are a couple of uh, state permits, uh, but they're amendments, not re-permitting. Right, so so in, in essence, uh, it would have to go back to the DRB for, for them to review it based on the, the original uh, memorandum of decision. Correct. Yeah. But also, <clears throat> You might not have to get within with the Act 250 piece because now we're no longer required to that, are we, Josh? Right. That is that is a good, a good question. I'm not quite sure how the the neighborhood development area designation would affect an amendment to a previously yeah. issued Act 250 permit. That's a good question. That's a good question um, to find the answer. So, out. I, that, unfortunately, yeah. I, I think it does not alleviate the responsibility for getting the amendment. Uh, we're They're proposing that in the legislature, but it hasn't passed yet. So I think, um, and we're, we are double checking this, but I think there's relief on the permit cost and there's relief on the permit timeframes potentially. Okay. Um, so if you, do, you know, they have to respond within a certain period of time for NDA areas, but I don't think yet that we can avoid um, going back to them for an amendment. So you don't think that's because it was an existing project already? Is that what you're thinking? Uh, yeah, okay. yeah. I, and there, I think there is a proposal to consider that, but I, I don't think it's law yet. Okay, well, 
I mean, I don't think it's going to be an issue. And I think most everybody fully supports what's going on here. So I can't believe that you run into, you know, any huge hurdles with that, but it's just, yeah, I, don't, I don't think so. We're, you know, we're sticking sort of within the spirit of the thing, just changing right. times, but, um, but it would be awful nice if we could eliminate it just for oh, time and money sure. and stuff, but. It would be extremely beneficial if you could eliminate it because yeah. all those things are quite, quite time consuming and costly. Right. It does, I think, half the fee, um, which is helpful. So you're asking tonight for us to set a date. And what date is your, your applications due? April 12th? April 12th. Yep. And then there has to be a notice you know, you need to be able to get it into, I think it's a, at least a paper of local circulation, at, if not um, in and other, you know, we would put it in other, um, you know, digital uh, notices too, but you have to at least put it in a paper of local circulation for, I think, a 15 day prior notice. So um, if we assume you know, the Herald on a Thursday, for example, that would be the 10th. And then you'd have to count 15 days from that. And I think that would still leave you early enough. But I didn't know what your schedule, your preferred schedule would be. Are you shooting for a Thursday, for example, because that's when you usually meet or would another day be be possible because it's, it's possible to do, um, I think, you know, Valley News or something that you might have more options for days of uh, notice. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, generally, and I don't know that this one, I don't know how much interest this one will pull, but usually these are the little five to 10 minute meetings. Right. Because nobody shows up. Um, We're going to have to have a special meeting for this. Which I'm fine with. I mean, I think, you know, I'd like to see this move along. It's been a lot. I'd love to see this project completed. <laughs> so, you know, if we have to meet, you know, have a special meeting to pull this off and get the grant application in there, uh, you know, I think that's a plus. Right now, it looks like we're the earliest we could do it is the 25th. The latest is the 29th. Um, I am. I'm going to be. Um, I'm going to be out of the country on the 25th. Well, I'll just be returning that day. So, um, I would prefer to do it on the 29th if we could. 29th. Or or the yeah. 20th, or the 28th or over the weekend. But uh, I won't be back in Randolph until sometime in the afternoon of the 25th. 29th is plenty of time if, if that works for people. The 28th, the 28th would be better for me. Fine with that too. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Okay, so. We need a motion. Uh, not, available the 28th. No, not available the 28th. Uh oh. Did I hear the 30th? <laughs> is, is the 30th soon? In, uh, actually, that's a problem for me. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think it's, we can't, we can't, uh, on, the, on the April side, we just can't get too close to the 12th. I think it's a four day, so maybe, I don't know if it's four working days or what. So, if as long as it were done, you know, kind of by early by early the second week of April, I think so, that would be enough. How about the thirty first? You guys are booked that night. What's that? That's open meeting law training. You guys are already booked for a couple hours that night. Oh boy. But we could do it at the same time. Do it right before that. Yeah. Yeah, that's 5.30 is the training start. Oh. 5.30 to what? Uh, 35? <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I would plan on uh, 
probably seven o'clock total for that. Is that is that VLCT training, Trevor? Yeah. 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 On what the thirty first? On the thirty first. Yeah. Killing me. Have there been substantive changes that require new training? Uh, I think it's when there's <laughs> enough transition and new people in, and it's good to sharpen our practices every so often. Anyway. Uh huh. So we could do the training from five thirty to seven and hold this hearing at seven fifteen. Yeah, seven fifteen, seven thirty. Sure. Let's back it up to seven fifteen. We should. It'll give us a reason to get out of the other one. <laughs> I like the way you. I like the way you think. <laughs> well, if it's supposed to last till seven, it keeps us on track, right? That's true, and it gives us an excuse to leave if we don't, you know, stay on track. <laughs> if we're uh, already gathered and need to make time in our schedule for that, it's easy to add a few minutes to the time versus set another night aside. So, uh, Julie, I think uh, you're hearing March thirty first at seven fifteen. How does that work? That's fine. That's the Thursday, the 31st. Right. And then you would have the select board meeting directly afterwards, right? Yes. Okay. And then, and then just to be clear, we take action at the end of the, I mean, we take action at the select board meeting. Right. You, you sort of close the hearing, open the meeting, and then vote on the question in the select right. board part of the meeting. I think parliamentarily, what you're actually going to do is open your meeting at 5:30 for the training. You'll end the training, then you'll open the public hearing. You won't recess the meeting. It won't be three separate meetings. No. Ah, yeah, there we go. Could be. You'll open yeah. the hearing at 7:15, close the hearing at seven something, and then you'll be back in your regular session. And the way we'll structure the agenda essentially will reflect that flow: open meeting, law training, public hearing at 7:15. You know, consider action on applying for the CDBG grant, you know, just after that. And so then they'll all link up. It'll be one agenda, one meeting, but you'll, you'll break for the hearing. We're fitted in, I should say, you're not breaking. You just, we'll call that out special. Okay, so do we have a motion to set that meeting up? I'll move that we set up uh, the uh, select board hearing and RACD Salisbury uh, Square CDBG grant consideration for 715 on Thursday, March 31st. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Next up is local cannabis control board discussion and planning commission direction. Thanks folks, bye-bye. Thanks, Julie. Take care, Julie. Thanks, Julie. This is a follow up from last time. Josh prepared a bunch of, uh, of information for you to consider from use charts to flow charts. Try to illustrate how things could work in different scenarios. And Josh there. So it's um if you're trying to talk, Josh, you're muted, but the um here he goes. Yeah, I'm here. So what you're looking at here, Josh, is to toss this to the planning commission to fill in the chart where the question marks are. Right. Yeah, and I, and I and I can uh, because the DRB met on Monday evening. Um, some of those question marks have been um, filled in. If if you give me sharing capacity, I can share the updated um, table. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna try that for you, Josh. You're, you're considered safe. Could you let him okay. go? Okay. Looks like I got. Uh, give him permission. Looks like I got permission here. Oh, you gave it to him. He, right. or he must have permission somehow. Um, I'm still this. I'm still disabled. Disabled. So. Uh, oh, can I just say make co-host? Try it. Yeah, making me co-host would do it. Yeah. Yeah, go. I was gonna say that might be the quickest way. Yep. So my only option. <laughs> it makes it even easier. <laughs> okay. Um, so can because everybody see that? Yes. Yeah. Yep. 
Um, okay, so this is the updated Oops, table uh, on the, DR, the DRB's uh, meeting on Monday. Um, so, you know, our, our, our land use regula regulations have um, a clause in there where if there's uh, a business type that's proposed that doesn't fall within uh, a category um, easily, then the DRB can give written permission. We talked about outdoor and indoor cultivation because they didn't really fall into any of our uh, use categories easily um, as defined within our regulations. Um, and so they um, determined that indoor cultivation would fall under uh, light industrial and outdoor cultivation uh, best fit under um, agri uh, rural industrial. Um, they, the DRB felt that it's, it's not a perfect scenario, but it's their best um, attempt to address the outstanding question. Um, so, so based on their determinations, this is the table um, that addresses the cannabis type of businesses that we would expect. Um, the, the yellow cells are the indicate um, districts where there are uh, limitations to all of the uh, type or all of the cannabis um, enterprises. So for instance, North and South Randolph villages, indoor cultivation, there's a limitation on the square footage. Um, the state of Vermont has proposed um, a, a tiered cultivator network up to 25,000 square feet. And I think, you know, in that district, uh, there's a limit on light manufacturing facilities up to say 6,000 square feet or 10,000 square feet. I, I, don't, I don't know the exact number, but the yellow, the yellow cell represents a, a limitation to all of the cannabis type of businesses um, regulated by the state. Uh, Josh, relative to size or uh, what are some of those conditional? Yeah, it's all, it's all square footage. So the cultivating side is, is based on, um, so the, you know, they have small cultivators at 1,000 square feet. Uh, 2,500 square feet, 5,000 square feet, 10,000 square feet, and then 25,000 square feet. Those are the those are the different licenses that are available. And, and, and does that apply to any type of crop? Uh, cannabis. Only to cannabis. Okay. But all right. And who sets those limitations? That's the Cannabis Control Board. Okay. All right. All right. I just was trying to clarify whether they applied to within the with it within the context of this discussion whether it applied applied to all types of crops or speaking strictly of cannabis. So no, um, cannabis. Uh, you know, it, this is all new. So you know, like every municipality is is going through this process um, because it's all very new. Um, agriculture mm -hmm. in general is regulated by the state of Vermont. Um, the zoning department we don't see. Um, really, we don't process zoning applications for agricultural practices because that's mm -hmm. all regulated with the state. You know, they inform us of what they're doing because that's that's part of state statute. They are supposed to inform us of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, it's all regulated by the uh, Department of Agriculture um, with the state. Um, however, because this uh, the state has deemed cannabis as not a farming practice, this kind of falls in this weird sort of um, mm -hmm. bucket. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Well. So Josh, this is the work of the Development Review Board, right? Doesn't the planning, the planning commission should be the one filling this out though, right? Not them. Right. They just, so, they just kind of put in play. So I, mean, right. I think the planning commission needs to do it. And I'm really concerned that we've knocked off all the interstate quadrants for growing outdoor hemp. We've got some great ag land there that's wide open. Yeah. So, um, so I think 
Trini, you're right. The Planning Commission um, has the purview of uh, amending our bylaws. Um, and the DRB has the ability to weigh in when this sort of situation pops up, um, which is not often, clearly. Um, and, and, and since we're working with the state, which this whole new sector, we're, we're trying to adjust to it. So I, I consider this to be um, another baby step in the process of um, getting this sector fully integrated into our land use regulations. Mm -hmm. um, so because there are, there are individuals who have inquired, you know, multiple individuals who have inquired over the last several weeks about um, cultivating businesses, retail businesses. And I, I thought it was really important to be able to give them feedback on what their process was going to be um, because the state application portal opens up in less than a month. Um, the pre-application portal opens up, I think, in about two or three weeks. Um, so there are, there are individuals in the community who want to put forward applications to the state, and they're just trying to figure out what the local process is going to be. So this is one step. Um, I can say that the individuals that I've communicated with, um, because of the DRB decision, they have, they have guidance now and they can, they can move forward. Actually, I've received one of the applications today. They would have to go to the DRB for, uh, for an indoor cultivation um, business. Retail does not open up until later in the year. So there's still some time there, but retail is retail. It doesn't matter. We allow retail in the districts that are indicated in the table. Um, and I would not expect that to change. I'm most concerned with the cultivation side because I do feel that there are districts that should allow cultivation, both indoor and outdoor, more importantly, outdoor, um, that we don't currently um, allow based on the use category of rural industrial. So I think part of the conversations that we had at the DRB side on Monday was that we, we have recognized that this is a first step and that the next step most likely is for the planning commission to look at this table um, and they're, they're gonna look at this next week at their next meeting. Um, and then to um, look at what, makes, what might make sense to do bylaw changes to allow more of the outdoor cultivation. Um, because I, I do think based on our current regulations, in those current use categories that they, they just need to be amended to allow more outdoor cultivation. Um, and, and so I think that's gonna be the next step for them in the planning commission. And um, so that's, that's where we are. And that, that would address Josh, the, uh, the Trini's concern about the interstate corridor. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I think- That I mean, seems like a no brainer to me. It kind of seems uh, like a no-brainer to me too. I mean, obviously, the state um, the state has some very specific requirements. Um, their own requirement is that it can't be um, you can't you can't view the cannabis from a public roadway, right? <laughs> so uh -huh. that's, so, okay. so that's that's their restriction. That's not ours. That's that's on the state. Um, right. However, there are many parcels um, in, in many districts that, that, that individuals could have a, thousand, a, a small uh, cultivator, thousand square foot uh, grow outdoors. And so I, I think it's important because even though the state doesn't think it's farming, it's farming. I mean, you're growing, yeah, a, you're growing a plant. So I, I think it's important to recognize that in and maybe the planning commission's role is to create another use category specifically for cannabis. Um, and so I, I think, you know, and again, on the planning commission side, they've seen this, that they, I think they are aware of the opportunity um, and maybe they're willing to go out there and, and uh, make the changes to al allow that business activity to happen on as many parcels as possible. Mm -hmm. So can I weigh in for a second? 
so I actually think this is a good thing that the DRB has weighed in on this because for 12 years, as long as I've been on the planning commission, we've been looking to the, get guidance from the DRB and this is the first time I think that's ever happened. So I'm kind of happy about this. And I think, you know, next week at the planning commission meeting, we can, you know, chew on this and, and see what those members think. Uh, but I really think this was a good approach. I, 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 agree, I agree, Perry. I, I mean, I, it felt a little clunky at first because I, I think it, it's a new sector. We're all trying to adjust, but I really, you know, reflecting back on it yesterday and today, um, I do feel like the DRB gave some guidance. Here it is. Here, here it is um, in our land use regulations, and now the Planning Commission can then uh, assess that and, and make the changes that they think is warranted. Um, to allow this this new type of business activity to happen in the districts that make sense. Yep, I agree. So I, you know, I'm, I'm I would be very anxious to to you know start on this process next week, which is this is kind of how I wanted you know how I felt it should have evolved right from the get go, and so now I think we've got got a, a good place to start here from. So. Uh. I still think one of the outstanding questions to the select board is whether or not that they um, uh, want to uh, create a cannabis control commission. Um, and I think part of the materials that you that were sent to you showed a flowchart of how applications might go through the town of Randolph um, yeah. if there was no commission and if there was a commission um and hopefully that that ex explains some some outstanding questions for everybody um the, the it would be just like the liquor control board licensing it would happen once a year right. um and so the examples that i i showed in that flow chart in essence was to, to show what it would be like for a, the first time applicant, right? They go through the zoning process, they go through the C Cannabis Control Commission and, and then they end up with their permitting and then they can open up their business. Um, they, the next year, they wouldn't have to go through the zoning. All right. they would have to do is submit a request to the Cannabis Control Commission uh, to receive their, their local license and, and, and that's it very similar to the, the liquor control board. Which I, which I agree with. So. I, yeah, entirely. Um, I thought we made the decision to do that and that it would function just like the liquor control. I don't know that we formally made that decision. I think we talked about it, but I don't recall that we. I think that was the direction we were moving in. So yeah, that yeah. It, the process would be very similar to what happens with liquor control and that way, you know, annually you get an opportunity to review situation and, you know, if, if for some reason somebody wasn't performing as expected, then we would have the right to rescind their license. Correct. Right. And does the same thing apply to the cultivation license, um, Josh? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah, any, any cannabis related enterprise would have to seek um, a local license in addition to the annual state license that they would have to renew. What do the cannabis regs um, require, if anything, in terms of um, securing the properties? I'm just curious. Um, it's, it's quite strict, to be quite mm -hmm. honest. There yeah, are I can imagine it would be. There are, there are various are some very strict um, guidelines laid out by the cannabis control board. Um, you know, we're talking video surveillance. Yep, um, yep. You know, um, the Dobermans can't, <laughs> can't be seen from the public roadway. Drones. Um, <laughs> right. I, it's it's very it's very secure. Um, it, it, so it, it's. You know, there, there might be uh, a situation where the planning commission feels that even the DRB uh, review of some of these is not warranted because the state process of review is so stringent. So, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. don't forget to have your helicopters, Tom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
outdoor cultivation is a, is an agricultural practice. I, I don't I don't my personal opinion opinion is is, is, I, is I, I don't think we should be regulating that as much as a lot of other practices. Right. Um, it's just like industrial hemp, corn, soybeans, whatever you want to call it. There's going to be a, a slight impact to neighboring properties with odor, possibly, but I, I don't foresee that being um, any more worse than the existing manure smell that individuals have to uh, endure. So I'm, I think I, you're, I'm yeah. told it's I'm told it's a really sweet smell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do a test drive somewhere. So <laughs> like. <clears throat> well, I'm fine with kicking this off to the planning commission with these kind of recommendations from the DRB. So, um, and then I'm sure we will get our input from the state. And no different than other zoning regs, you know, there's a lot of things that our regulations, you know, defer to state statute on. So I think we can probably make that all work through this process. Yeah, I, I would just like to add that it, it sounds like we should try and, and, and really be diligent about this, given the time frames for um, beginning to file applications that, that Josh spelled out, uh, particularly on the cultivation front. Um, uh, you know, we passed this a year ago and we don't want, um, uh, we don't want to put people behind the eight ball on the application process by dragging our heels on defining where and, and what they can do. So I just like well, to see. The other side of that coin is I still want to be cautious here. Yeah. So yeah. No. They can file their application at that point. Doesn't mean that that's their window of opportunity has expired. Yeah. Okay. 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 It's not like we have to rush into this. I really would like to, you know, do some due diligence on this and, you know, yeah. we're not, I don't think we drag our heels, but I think we want to make sure that we've, you know, dotted our I's, crossed our T's as much as we possibly can. And, and that's not to say that we might not have to make some amendments or changes down the road six months. Right, right, right. Because that's what we do with zoning regulations. <laughs> we keep tweaking yeah. them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Living document. Because we're not, that's right, it's a living document and we're never right the first time, so... But yes, I think it that sounds like we're it sounds like we're ready to send this to the planning commission. Sounds good to me. I, Does that require a motion? No. No, I think not. Not really. Assignment. I I just like to thank Josh for that really clear explanation of where we're yeah. at. That was really helpful. That's wonderful. Thank right. you. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I think this is a, a, an important new sector. Um, with some opportunity in the community. So I just want to make sure that um, everybody is, is, is on board and, and, and clear with, it, with how our regulations affect it. Mm -hmm. Okay, kick it down the road. <laughs> so when, <laughs> when, when will be the right time for us to make our official decision about establishing a local board for cannabis? My guess is it's gonna come in with the new zoning regulations from the planning commission. Adopt it all as one. Yeah, that okay. seemed reasonable. Great. You uh... Send it off to Sonny and he'll get it done. Yep. All right. Next up is uh, the EV charging station on Pleasant Street. Is this one yours too, Josh? Yes, it is. And I and I uh, don't know. I think. I sent uh, Trevor everything, um, and so I, I think I know what you guys are looking at. So I'll just give an update. Um, this uh, has spawned out of the state of Vermont's uh, VW settlement um, funds. Um, and so, uh, Trini, you probably know about this. Um, they had uh, a program where they wanted to use some of this money um, 
to invest in EV charging stations along the inter interstate corridors. Um, and, and so when they rolled this out um, last year, um, the state contracted with a vendor and that vendor then uh, reached out to private uh, business owners um, along the interstate corridor um, in Randolph. They reached out to McDonald's and they had reached out to uh, the, the Summit distribution up at the barn. Um, neither one wanted to uh, uh, lo locate the EV charging stations there. Um, and so the state came That's to so us to try to uh, figure out an alternative location. Um, they were, the state really wanted it to be right off from the interchange, um, but because those two locations didn't work out, I tried to get them to come downtown. Eventually their committee um, accepted that and voted to approve a, a downtown location. And so they started to work with um, Jerry Ward um, over on Pleasant Street um, because one of the goals was to um, site the EV charging stations uh, close to amenities. And, um, and so that has been an ongoing process uh, for a long time um, for a number of reasons. Um, that partnership um, had to end. And so Blink, the vendor who's contracted with the state um, has, is looking for an alternative site. Um, so their proposal to the town of Randolph is to um, site the EV charging stations in the Pleasant Street parking lot, which I, I see is up now. Um, the power would still be coming from the pole um, that is in the south, I guess, um, southeast corner of the, of the former Huggable Mug building. There's a, there's a Green Mountain Power pole right there. And power would be trenched um, along, along their property, along the town's property to um, this, this first um, sort of parking median um, in that parking lot. Um, there would be uh, three chargers. Um, I think, oh, well, three, three charging stations um, with four chargers total. Um, and, and then the, the, then the power um, banks would be trenched to uh, the you know the switch the switch gear and the power cabinets right here on the edge of the parking lot. Um, so Blink is the vendor. They they're proposing to do all of this. They 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 do all of the work. They do all of the trenching. Um, they install all the equipment. Um, and in essence, it's a um, an agreement with the town of Randolph um, where people will access the EV charging stations. They have to pay for yes. that. Um, and that revenue would cover the expenses. Um, and when the revenue surpasses the expenses, there's a profit sharing agreement. I think it's, it's, it's a 5% um, share. So that that sort of in a in a summary is what Blink is proposing, and, and a little bit of the history of, of where we are today. What's what's the speed of these chargers? Just out of curiosity. The, what, so yeah, the proposal is so two of them are are like are like normal um, dual L two chargers, right? Okay. Um, and then the other two are the fast chargers. So ah. you know. A okay. fully a, a fully charged vehicle in like less than thirty minutes. Well, th that's an outstanding opportunity because, uh, well, I, I'm an electric car owner, so I follow these things. And right now, there is only one thirty minute, maybe two, in the entire state of Vermont. Yes. Um, 
there's one in South Burlington and there's one in Waitsfield. Um, so this is a real plus. Um, the, the distance from the inter interstate is a little bit of a drawback, but on the other hand, it brings people into the village, right? right. Yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm really surprised that both Summit and McDonald's turned this down, although Summit doesn't surprise me because their bread and butter is motor oil, you know, fossil fuels, but... Um, uh, I, 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 will, I will say um, Summit last year, they went through um, a, a, an application, a zoning application through the DRB to do a site plan renovation. Um, and, and part of that renovation was um, to install a couple EV charging stations. Huh. So that, that is in their business plan. I, I surmise that that uh, activity will happen this year. Um, and they want all the revenue is the, the story there. That... Right. Well, I think it was more of they already had a contract with another vendor. So that's why they couldn't be interested with this, this other vendor. Right. So. And the, the next closest, the only other chargers in town right now are at VTC. Uh, and they're not fast chargers. Um, right. So. Right. Um, but I mean, I mean, bottom line is it, it, gets, it gets some EV charging stations in the downtown. Um, which we know individuals with electric vehicles are going to be looking at. That's an increasing demographic. Yeah. Um, and so more, you know, long-term, it will provide an opportunity for, for more people to come into the downtown um, mm -hmm. and, you know, be able to use those chargers and then access the businesses that are down. Absolutely. And it's no cost to the town to install yeah, them. What's that, Trini? I think we got to look at this contract though. I completely agree. It's a great opportunity, but it's a terrible contract. You're signing on for 30 years. You're signing on to a maintenance responsibility. A sign, you get signage, providing them a Wi-Fi connection. You're, you're t you are taking on some stuff. Uh, if for some reason you have them remove them, you know, um, you've got a liability for that. If they don't remove them, you're responsible to remove them. This isn't uh, Yeah, you, you're right I about the, I, the, the 30 year renewal. I mean, we've just had a recent experience with these automatic renewals, so. And we don't like it on that no. one so <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but it's uh you're signing up that you know we've got a at our own expense um do some of this which includes keeping all the wiring and all that in a state of good repair and we don't keep the wiring to anything else i mean uh, you know all i mean all of the all of the infrastructure will be underground um so it, it's all through trenching, it's all underground um, from the power pole to the EV charging stations to the power cabinets uh, at the edge of the, uh, the parking lot. Um, you know, I think, I think a lot of the, the, the responsibility for the town would lie on ensuring that snow removal um, is, is done in a way that allows customers to access the, the charging ports um, so that, you know, I don't, I don't believe that is a huge issue based on the, the location and just how they install it. You know, they have yellow bollards there to protect the equipment. Um, you know, and some of it is, um, some of the contract is, is, I think, I think it says something like, you know, you will have sufficient lighting in the parking lot. Um, and I, and I think that's just something that in, in general, we should have sufficient lighting in the parking lot anyway, which, which is, might be questionable at this point. Um, so, um, Josh, if, if summit does go ahead with their own plans though, and they put, um, let's say they put a pair of high speed chargers up, uh, up there, how much impact is that likely to have? 
on the blink systems usage in the village? Uh, to be to be honest, I don't I don't know. I don't yeah. I don't know if they're planning on high speed charging. That's not part of the DRB re review. Okay. Um, I mean, it, they could be planning on that, or they might not be. I, that's just not part of the their re yeah. Their review. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, um, you have an electric vehicle, Tom, right? Right. Yeah, I do. So I know other people who have electric vehicles. Um, when they go out to eat, they go to communities with where they know they can oh, charge yeah. their vehicle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we don't have that in, in downtown Randall. No, we don't. So, no, don't. you know, I, I look at it as um, this, um, this market of electric, electric vehicles is only going to grow over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Without a doubt. So um, if, we, <clears throat> if we don't have it, then what is the impetus for anybody with an electric vehicle to come in, into our downtown? Because the state of Vermont is covering the cost of installation, it, it, it makes it you know, a pretty good opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, sure. We are responsible for some of um, the maintenance, making sure the snow is not there, making sure it's not damaged. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm not aware of any widespread sort of like um, damage to town owned property um, in, the, in the downtown or, or the community as a whole. Um, but in general, I, I, think it's, I think it's a pretty good opportunity um, to get some EV charging stations in the, in the downtown, which normally um, we would have had to apply to the state um, for their EV charging grant and come up with a match. So in this case, we don't have to come up with a match. It's, mm -hmm. it's all done. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good idea, Josh. I just don't, I think this is a pretty one-sided yeah. agreement. Yeah, you know it. Yeah, you know, they, uh, I think the town's going to give up house. space in the parking lot. Um, it does say oh, we yeah. have to have it well lit. And it also does say in here that if it requires any maintenance or replacement, that it, the cost is on us. But we get 5% of the profit after all their expenses are paid. We are responsible for installing and paying the costs for signage that they'll provide us the sign. And it's uh I don't know who's somebody's there's a bunch of background noise. I don't know what that yeah. is. Yeah, it wasn't even good the last time we came up with road. I think it's Trini. It was over. Yeah, I probably got too much going on at one place, but um, <laughs> you know, I do we know what these what the maintenance cost what the maintenance costs are and what the actual fees are from other municipalities or locations they put these in? Um, I, no, I don't think there is available data because uh, again, this is. Um, this is part of the VW settlement money. Um, this is a program that was just rolled out last year. Um, I don't think any of the sites that were identified have actually even broke ground yet. Um, you know, and, and clearly like we, you know, we haven't um, executed an agreement. I know there's at least one or two other communities that haven't executed agree an agreement because they're, they're just trying to work through um, some issues. And so the other, I think there's um, 12, 12 or 14 total sites that they're trying to get these um, installed in. Um, so I don't, there's not enough data to support any sort of uh, ongoing expenses that might be incurred. If there are certain, if there are questions though, um, from any of the select board members on the contract that's been proposed, um, I think, you know, it's a good opportunity to then, you know, we could, we could take that back to the vendor um, to either inquire about clarity over a specific condition or um, indicate a desire to have it changed um, and, and see what happens. Yeah. 
I mean, for instance, looking at, uh, I'm just kind of drilling into the fine print here and where it talks about maintenance and plus customer service that the client is responsible for carrying the costs of any um, maintenance or replacement due to vandalism. Presumably that could be covered under our insurance, could it not? As long as it was something in excess of a deductible. I mean, right. That would, right. That would be the threshold, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Trini, where are you seeing other areas of concern? I mean, I'm just looking over this in terms of the, the town's responsibility, the client's responsibilities. I think, um, first off, being in the 30-year contract. Yeah. On a you know, what is the maintenance? I know we've got problems now getting our staff out to do the shoveling. These are gonna require shoveling around them. Because um, we're not gonna be able to plow right up tight to them. Right. Given their location. Um, so, you know, kind of what are, what are we taking on? You know, then you got some indemnification language in here that's a little bit interesting, but. Um, yeah, that we definitely should have somebody look at. Yeah, you guys want to have us send this to Mike Tarrant kind of as a next step and, and get him to go through some of those pieces. And then at the same time, we might want to pull out some of the term condition questions to go back to the vendor uh, as suggested. Yep. <coughs> Excuse me. That's where I was going next is I think you really ought to send it up to Mike and I'm not my personal no. feeling is, is I'm not interested in a 30 year solid contract. I might be interested in maybe a seven to 10 or something with renewals um, as a starter. I'm just. It's a know, 10 God. with three, with two automatic tens. That yeah, that's, that, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm thinking um, this sh a shorter term because who knows, you know, technology could change a lot in the next five to seven years. Yeah. I, I would agree with Perry about the technology changing. It's not hard to imagine that in 10 years, <clears throat> battery storage will have taken a leap of some sort and these, these machines will be largely obsolete and what will be our obligation um, at that point. Um, exactly. I, 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 I'd also, I, also would want, I also would like to have harder numbers about what their requirements are for lighting and, and these other maintenance pieces and what are what our actual year annual sort of costs are are, are, are looking like um it, it does seem like we could be getting into something where we're like oh boy that sounded good but we're we're looking at costs which were quite a bit higher than we really anticipated i also have to say i mean as an ev as an ev owner and driver i mean my primary car is an ev uh, we also have a gas car in our family that we use for longer trips and so on. But I've never heard of this network. Um, um, the, the two primary providers in the state and around the country are ChargePoint and EVgo. And I've never heard of the Blink network. So that's, yeah. not, to, that's not to say they're not um, entirely above board, but I'm just not familiar with them. Yeah, the original company that had um, the contract with the state of Vermont um, to be honest, I don't even remember their original name. They were out of New Jersey uh -huh. uh, and, and they were acquired by Blink, yeah. which is out of Florida okay. um, last year, which delayed the rollout of this. Uh, this this, is, this wow. has been a, a project uh, at the state level that has that started, I think, actually at the end of 2020. Uh, but because of the acquisition by Blink, it kind of uh, delayed the actual implementation. Okay. Yeah, I think the other question, Josh, on this, or, or the thing we got to push back on this, there is a, a exclusive right clause in here, which basically says if any property that the town owns, leases, or manages, you want to put an EV station, they get to put it in. Yes. Yeah. That and that that definitely well, stood out for me also. Well, I'm, I'm broadly, uh, yeah, I'm, bro yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm broadly comfortable with this idea, but I, I do think that, that Perry and Trini are right, that we need to have the attorney take a look at this and, and just drill into some of the details. Um, I think it could be a real boon 
um, to have this in the village and to pull people in off the interstate. Uh, I mean, that's the national strategy is to put these things within, within half a mile to, to four miles of the interstate nationwide. Uh, that's, 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 you know, that's the Biden agenda. Um, so this is a great opportunity, but we need to, we need to make sure our, our, our butts are covered, if you will, on some of these details. Fair, fair enough, yep. Well, and as the technology improves, you may find that there'll be other players in the market. So, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm, you know, it's just, I would hate to see us locked into some, I, I think 10 years is way too long. And that's just my, my opinion on, based on the technology, you know, something else could evolve and, you know, we we're going to say, oh, well, you know, we're stuck with this for another five years and something else came out, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, and they can walk away from it. And then it's yours. Yeah, well, yeah, that could happen too. So, yes. yes, yeah, they have the right to do it in the contract, but you don't have the right to walk away from it. The town can't walk away from it, but they can. Yeah, <laughs> it's not it's a little one-sided to me. Uh, I I think seven to ten is 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 probably reasonable, but this this business of um, automatic renewals, forget about it. Um, uh, And, and I, I'm saying that as a passionate advocate for these things. Um, I wouldn't have gotten one if I, if I wasn't. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted with it. But, um, and I want to see this infrastructure everywhere. But I want to make sure that it's fair to all concerned, too. So, Do we yeah, send it to the lawyer uh, next? Or do we I go back to them with some of the areas we're concerned about and see what their response is? Because if they're not willing to change the language, there's no reason to tie up a lawyer. I would say, you know, maybe Trevor knows what our concerns are. So maybe you go run it by him early and say, look, these are some of the things we're thinking about. Are you guys... Is it negotiable or is that it? And if they say, well, no, that's it, then we're done. Yeah. Yeah. You okay with that, Trevor? Yeah, we can do that. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Been fun. Gosh. Next up is sick leave bank policy addendum. Yeah, we've been trying to figure out ways we we had particularly at the end of December and into January, we had a few employees as part of the Omicron surge um, that ended up testing positive for COVID-19. And um, it was a, a mixed group and then we had some veterans who had sick time were able to be out sort of for the minimum um, amount of time under the public health right. guidelines in place. At the time, we had a couple that um, one employee who was new enough that they didn't have enough accumulated leave time, and another one who um, just didn't have a sufficient store. Um, we don't have any mechanism in those cases to do much with regard to. We've asked them to stay out. It's uh, you know, the public health guidelines want them to stay out. Keep other people safe to stay out. We don't have any even tool to figure out how to cover that sick time. Should it not be available? And the sick leave policy is designed for some longer term situations where maybe you have a little bit more notice as well. Um, so the idea was we've got in each case, there's a certain amount of, of um, you know, folks who are eligible to donate who would still, still stay well within the parameters of the policy that's in place in terms of that, that component of it, or be able to donate to, to these pieces to either fully um, cover the time in one case or to help offset some of the time in another case. Um, we don't have a tool set uh, really to get there, which based on the policy could be, we've got um, maybe about 31 cal calendar days. You have to sort of exhaust your other time or benefits. Um, you know, generally there's a donation required to, to be eligible um, and sort of annual donations of time. And so just, in response to COVID, the idea was a policy then gets tacked on to the end. It's only there through the end of the calendar year. Um, it would run through sort of a manager's approval that would allow us to kind of 
check all the pieces in terms of what are you doing um, uh, to comply with any of the guidelines. Um, and we set those pieces up rather than the committee. So it has a few few differences. I don't even know that we'll put it in place and have to use it again, um, but it would be, I think, specific to, um, to help the, the pair of employees who, who were in this situation. Um, by the way, everybody else who's, who's had some level of impact had some amount of time accrued that they were able to use or, or the large offset. So but just, it's just looking for a mechanism and this is the one we hit on right now. Uh, I figure we float it and see and just propose a, a quick little language. Essentially what we'd be asking to do in that is to waive the eligibility section um, at the front end. And you're essentially keeping all of the other policy components in place other than having the, the application head to the manager's office rather than a sick leave committee. Um, We have plenty of hours in the bank. It, yeah, and the employees that would be able to donate specifically in one case would essentially we'd put them in and, and the draw would kind of come back out um, you know, commensurate to the number of hours. That's a mix of employees from departments that were impacted through it. Through, through. I think that's a good idea. That's not... it, it, and the folks we're talking about followed our, you know, what we asked them to do, they, they, they did it. Thoughts, questions? Well, um, I guess I would say that probably we should take a serious look at this um, and as it says here, you know, the addendum would expire December 31st of 2022. So I would hope by then that the COVID situation has disappeared. So I'm all for, you know, moving forward with this. It seems like we could put something pretty simple together relatively quickly. So with that being said, I'm not quite sure I'm ready to make a motion, but I listen to more discussion. <laughs> Not hearing much more discussion. I know. <laughs> Shock. <laughs> well, do, do we think it's needed or not at this point? I mean, you know, is is well, are we out of the woods or not? It's hard to say. Congress thinks so. Nobody was wearing a mask the other night. That's true. Yes, so th this would help us with the, the pair that have already been impacted and then would set us up should we have anybody else who, who falls in there. So it's a little bit of, of, of looking back. Um, there wouldn't be anybody else in that timeline that would, that would be eligible. Yeah, anything. I mean, if we, if we sunset it at the end of the year and we do have a spike again when the cold weather comes back with some new variant, we could always extend it right so yeah yep. yeah is, is this ready to be accepted or do you need to be amended? i think we could go with the language that's there i could i could always find ways to tinker with the words so. <laughs> <laughs> um, all I right question that we proceed with this amendment to the hours bank i'll second that We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Jane, motion carries. Thank you. Any other business? I just want to report that during the meeting, um, I got an email from Karen uh, Dillon that she is not going to be able to continue serving on the Arts and Culture Committee. So when I send, the, that means we'll have a third vacancy. And when I send the list to Kim tomorrow, I'll pull... Uh, I'll pull Karen off it. She's just citing time constraints with um, with everything she's involved with at Chandler. So. Okay. Anything else under other business? Manager's report. 
anything really to add from what you have <coughs> there for you. We are fully staffed here at the offices for the first time in four months. <laughs> four whole days now it's kind of nice so our new finance person is on board yep oh yeah has lamps and pictures hung up and <laughs> excellent ready. excellent yeah. yeah she's great i hope we don't have any guests right now it's just the select board and us <laughs> wow great next right. session is an executive session yeah, we keep it real quick. Just wanted to touch base on a couple of things that are that are coming up. Okay. I make the motion to go in executive session. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We will take a few minute break and come back.